a murmur in the room attracted his attention. Mr. Brown was advancing from the door, gallantly escorting Aunt Julia, who leaned upon his arm, smiling and hanging her head. An irregular musketry of applause escorted her also as far as the piano, and then, as Mary Jane seated herself on the stool, and Aunt Julia, no longer smiling, half turned so as to pitch her voice fairly into the room, gradually ceased. Gabriel recognized the prelude. It was that of an old song of Aunt Julia's, arrayed for the bridal. Her voice, strong and clear in tone, attacked with great spirit the runs which embellished the air, and though she sang very rapidly, she did not miss even the smallest of the grace notes. To follow the voice without looking at the singer's face was to feel and share the excitement of swift and secure flight. Gabriel applauded loudly with all the others at the close of the song, and loud applause was borne in from the invisible supper table. It sounded so genuine that a little color struggled into Aunt Julia's face as she bent to replace in the music stand the old leather-bound songbook that had her initials on the cover. Freddie Mallins, who had listened with his head perched sideways to hear her better, was still applauding when everyone else had ceased and talking animatedly to his mother, who nodded her head gravely and slowly in acquiescence. At last, when she could clap no more, he stood up suddenly and hurried across the room to Aunt Julia, whose hand he seized and held in both his hands, shaking it when words failed him or the catch in his voice proved too much for him. I was just telling my mother, he said, I never heard you sing so well, never. No, I never heard your voice so good as it is tonight. Now, would you believe that now? That's the truth. Upon my word and honor, that's the truth. I never heard your voice sound so fresh and so, so clear and fresh, never. Aunt Julia smiled broadly and murmured something about compliments as she released her hand from his grasp. Mr. Brown extended his open hand towards her and said to those who were near him, in the manner of a showman introducing a prodigy to an audience, Miss Julia Morkin, my latest discovery. He was laughing very heartily at this himself when Freddie Mallins turned to him and said, Well, Brown, if you're serious, you might make a worse discovery. All I can say is, I never heard her sing half so well as long as I am coming here, and that's the honest truth. Neither did I, said Mr. Brown. I think her voice has greatly improved. Aunt Julia shrugged her shoulders and said with meek pride, Thirty years ago I hadn't a bad voice as voices go. I often told Julia, said Aunt Kate emphatically, that she was simply thrown away in that choir, but she never would be said by me. She turned as if to appeal to the good sense of the others against a refractory child, while Aunt Julia gazed in front of her, a vague smile of reminiscence plain on her face. No, continued Aunt Kate. She wouldn't be said or led by anyone, slaving there in that choir night and day, night and day, six o'clock on Christmas morning, and all for what? Well, isn't it for the honor of God, Aunt Kate, asked Mary Jane, twisting round on the piano stool and smiling. Aunt Kate turned fiercely on her niece and said, I know all about the honor of God, Mary Jane, but I think it's not at all honorable for the Pope to turn out the women out of the choirs that have slaved there all their lives and put little whippersnappers of boys over their heads. I suppose it is for the good of the church if the Pope does it, but it's not just Mary Jane, it's just not right. She had worked herself into a passion and would have continued in defense of her sister, for it was a sore subject with her. But Mary Jane, seeing that all the dancers had come back, intervened pacifically. Now, Aunt Kate, you're giving scandal to Mr. Brown, who was of the other persuasion. Aunt Kate turned to Mr. Brown, who was grinning at this allusion to his religion, and said hastily, Oh, I don't question the Pope being right. I am only a stupid old woman, and I wouldn't presume to do such a thing. But there's such a thing as common everyday politeness and gratitude, and if I were in Julia's place, I'd tell that Father Healy straight up to his face. And besides, Aunt Kate, said Mary Jane, we really are all hungry. And when we are hungry, we are all very quarrelsome. And when we are thirsty, we are also quarrelsome, added Mr. Brown. So that we had better go to supper, said Mary Jane, 
and finished the discussion afterwards. On the landing outside the drawing room, Gabriel found his wife and Mary Jane trying to persuade Miss Ivers to stay for supper. But Miss Ivers, who had put on her hat and was buttoning her cloak, would not stay. She did not feel in the least hungry, and she had already overstayed her time. But only for ten minutes, Molly, said Mrs. Conroy. That won't delay you. To take a pick itself, said Mary Jane, after all your dancing. I really couldn't, said Miss Ivers. I'm afraid you didn't enjoy yourself at all, said Mary Jane hopelessly. Ever so much, I assure you, said Miss Ivers. But you really must let me run off now. But how can you get home, asked Mrs. Conroy. Oh, it's only two steps up the quay. Gabriel hesitated a moment and said, If you will allow me, Miss Ivers, I'll see you home if you are really obliged to go. But Miss Ivers broke away from them. I won't hear of it, she cried. For goodness sake, go into your suppers and don't mind me. I'm quite well able to take care of myself. Well, you're the comical girl, Molly, said Mrs. Conroy frankly. Be not lieb, cried Mrs. Ivers with a laugh as she ran down the staircase. Mary Jane gazed after her, a moody, puzzled expression on her face, while Mrs. Conroy leaned over the banisters to listen for the hall door. Gabriel asked himself, was he the cause of her abrupt departure? But she did not seem to be in ill humor. She had gone away laughing. He stared blankly down the staircase. At the moment, Aunt Kate came toddling out of the supper room, almost wringing her hands in despair. Where's Gabriel, she cried. Where on earth is Gabriel? There's everyone waiting in there, stage to let, and nobody to carve the goose. Here I am, Aunt Kate, cried Gabriel, with sudden animation, ready to carve a flock of geese if necessary. A fat brown goose lay at one end of the table, and at the other end, on a bed of creased paper strewn with sprigs of parsley, lay a great ham, stripped of its outer skin and peppered over with crust crumbs, a neat paper frill round its shin, and beside this was a round of spiced beef. Between these rival ends ran parallel lines of side dishes, two little ministers of jelly, red and yellow, a shallow dish full of blocks of blanc mange and red jam, a large green leaf-shaped dish with a stock-shaped handle, on which lay bunches of purple raisins and peeled almonds, a companion dish on which lay solid rectangle of Smyrna figs, a dish of custard topped with grated nutmeg, a small bowl full of chocolates and sweets wrapped in gold and silver papers, and a glass vase in which stood some tall celery stalks. In the center of the table there stood, as sentries to a fruit stand, which upheld a pyramid of oranges and American apples, two squat old-fashioned decanters of cut glass, one containing port and the other dark sherry. On the closed square piano, a pudding in a huge yellow dish lay in waiting, and behind it were three squads of bottles of stout and ale and minerals, drawn up according to the colors of their uniforms, the first two black with brown and red labels, the third and smallest squad white with transverse green sashes. Gabriel took his seat boldly at the head of the table, and having looked to the edge of the carver, plunged his fork firmly into the goose. He felt quite at ease now, for he was an expert carver, and liked nothing better than to find himself at the head of a well-laden table. Mrs. Furlong, what shall I send you, he asked, a wing or a slice of the breast? Just a small slice of the breast. Mrs. Higgins, what for you? Oh, anything at all, Mr. Conroy. Well, Gabriel and Miss Daly exchanged plates of goose and plates of ham and spiced beef. Lily went from guest to guest with a dish of hot flory potatoes wrapped in a white napkin. This was Mary Jane's idea, and she had also suggested applesauce for the goose, but Aunt Kate had said that plain roast goose without any applesauce had always been good enough for her, and she hoped she might never eat worse. Mary Jane waited on her pupils and saw that they got the best slices, and Aunt Kate and Aunt Julia opened and carried across from the piano bottles of stout and ale for the gentlemen and bottles of minerals for the ladies. There was a great deal of confusion and laughter and noise, 
the noise of orders and counter-orders, of knives and forks, of corks and glass stoppers. Gabriel began to carve second helpings as soon as he had finished the first round without serving himself. Everyone protested loudly so that he compromised by taking a long draught of stout, for he had found the carving hot work. Mary Jane settled down quietly to her supper, but Aunt Kate and Aunt Julia were still toddling round the table, walking on each other's heels, getting in each other's way, and giving each other unheeded orders. Mr. Brown begged of them to sit down and eat their suppers, and so did Gabriel. But they said there was time enough, so that at last Freddie Mallon stood up and, capturing Aunt Kate, plumped her down on her chair amid general laughter. When everyone had been well served, Gabriel said, smiling, Now, if anyone wants a little more of what vulgar people call stuffing, let him or her speak. A chorus of voices invited him to begin his own supper, and Lily came forward with three potatoes which she had reserved for him. Very well, said Gabriel amiably, as he took another preparatory draught. Kindly forget my existence, ladies and gentlemen, for a few minutes. He set to his supper and took no part in the conversation with which the table covered Lily's removal of the plates. The subject of talk was the opera company, which was then at the Theatre Royal. Mr. Bartell Darcy, the tenor, a dark-complexioned young man with a smart mustache, praised very highly the leading contralto of the company, but Miss Furlong thought that she had a rather vulgar style of production. Freddie Mellons said there was a Negro chieftain singing in the second part of the Gaiety Pantomime, who had one of the finest tenor voices he had ever heard. Have you heard him? he asked Mr. Bartell Darcy across the table. No, answered Mr. Bartell Darcy carelessly. Because, Freddie Mallins explained, now I'd be curious to hear your opinion of him. I think he has a grand voice. It takes Teddy to find out the really good things, said Mr. Brown familiarly to the table. And why couldn't he have a voice too? asked Freddie Mallins sharply. Is it because he's only a black? Nobody answered this question, and Mary Jane led the table back to the legitimate opera. One of her pupils had given her a pass for Mignon. Of course, it was very fine, she said, but it made her think of poor Georgina Burns. Mr. Brown could go back farther still to the old Italian companies that used to come to Dublin. Tychens, Yima de Merxa, Campanini, the Great Trebelli, Giuglini, Ruvelli, Amburo. Those were the days, he said, when there was something like singing to be heard in Dublin. He told, too, of how the top gallery of the Old Royal used to be packed night after night, of how one night an Italian tenor had sung five encores to Let Me Like a Soldier Fall, introducing a high C every time, and of how the gallery boys would sometimes, in their enthusiasm, unyoke the horses from the carriage of some great prima donna and pull her themselves through the streets to her hotel. Why did they never play the grand old operas now, he asked. Donora, Lucretia Borgia. Because they could not get the voices to sing them, that was why. Oh, well, said Mr. Bartell Darcy. I presume there are good singers today as there were then. Where are they, asked Mr. Brown defiantly. In London, Paris, Milan, said Mr. Bartell Darcy warmly. I suppose Caruso, for example, is quite as good, if not better than any of the men you have mentioned. Maybe so, said Mr. Brown, but I may tell you I doubt it strongly. Oh, I'd give anything to hear Caruso sing, said Mary Jane. For me, said Aunt Kate, who had been picking a bone, there was only one tenor. To please me, I mean. But I suppose none of you ever heard of him. Who was he, Miss Morgan, asked Bartell Darcy politely. His name, said Aunt Kate, was Parkinson. I heard him when he was in the prime, and I think he had then the purest tenor voice that was ever put into a man's throat. Strange, said Mr. Bartell Darcy. I've never heard of him. Yes, yes, Miss Morkin is right, said Mr. Brown. I remember hearing of old Parkinson, but he's too far back for me. A beautiful, pure, sweet, mellow English tenor, said Aunt Kate with enthusiasm. Gabriel having finished, the huge pudding was transferred to the table. The clatter of forks and spoons began again. Gabriel's wife 
served out spoonfuls of the pudding and passed the plates down the table. Midway down, they were held up by Mary Jane, who replenished them with raspberry or orange jelly or with blank mange and jam. The pudding was of Aunt Julia's making, and she received praises for it from all quarters. She herself said that it was not quite brown enough. Well, I hope, Miss Morgan, said Mr. Brown, that I'm brown enough for you, because you know I'm all brown. All the gentlemen, except Gabriel, ate some of the pudding out of compliment to Aunt Julia. As Gabriel never ate sweets, the celery had been left for him. Freddy Mallins also took a stalk of celery and ate it with his pudding. He had been told that celery was a capital thing for the blood, and he was just then under doctor's care. Mrs. Mallins, who had been silent all through the supper, said that her son was going down to Mount Melloray in a week or so. The table then spoke of Mount Melloray, how bracing the air was down there, how hospitable the monks were, and how they never asked for a penny piece from their guests. And do you mean to say, asked Mr. Brown incredulously, that a chap can go down there and put up there as if it were a hotel and live on the fat of the land and then come away without paying anything? Oh, most people give some donation to the monastery when they leave, said Mary Jane. I wish we had an institution like that in our church, said Mr. Brown candidly. He was astonished to hear that the monks never spoke, got up at two in the morning, and slept in their coffins. He asked what they did it for. That's the rule of the order, said Aunt Kate firmly. Yes, but why, asked Mr. Brown. Aunt Kate repeated that it was the rule, that was all. Mr. Brown still seemed not to understand. Freddy Mallins explained to him, as best he could, that monks were trying to make up for the sins committed by all the sinners in the outside world. The explanation was not very clear for Mr. Brown, grinned and said, I like the idea very much, but wouldn't a comfortable spring bed do them as well as a coffin? The coffin, said Mary Jane, is to remind them of their last end. As the subject had grown lugubrious, it was buried in a silence of the table, during which Mrs. Mallins could be heard saying to her neighbor in an indistinct undertone, They are very good men, the monks, very pious men. The raisins and almonds and figs and apples and oranges and chocolates and sweets were now passed about the table, and Aunt Julia invited all the guests to have either port or sherry. At first Mr. Bartell Darcy refused to take either, but one of his neighbors nudged him and whispered something to him, upon which he allowed his glass to be filled. Gradually, as the last glasses were being filled, the conversation ceased. A pause followed, broken only by the noise of the wine and by unsettlings of the chairs. The Mrs. Morkin, all three, looked down at the tablecloth. Someone coughed once or twice, and then a few gentlemen patted the table gently as a signal for silence. The silence came, and Gabriel pushed back his chair. The patting at once grew louder in encouragement, and then ceased altogether. Gabriel leaned his ten trembling fingers on the tablecloth and smiled nervously at the company. Meeting a row of upturned faces, he raised his eyes to the chandelier. The piano was playing a waltz tune, and he could hear the skirts sweeping against the drawing-room door. People, perhaps, were standing in the snow on the quay outside, gazing up at the lighted windows and listening to the waltz music. The air was pure there. In the distance lay the park where the trees were weighted with snow. The Wellington Monument wore a gleaming cap of snow that flashed westward over the white field of fifteen acres. He began, Ladies and gentlemen, it has fallen to my lot this evening, as in years past, to perform a very pleasing task, but a task for which I am afraid my poor powers as a speaker are all too inadequate. No, no, said Mr. Brown. But however that may be, I can only ask you tonight to take the will for the deed and to lend me your attention for a few moments while I endeavor to express to you in words what my feelings are on this occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not the first time that we have gathered together under this hospitable roof, around this hospitable board. 
It is not the first time that we have been the recipients, or perhaps I had better say the victims, of the hospitality of certain good ladies. He made a circle in the air with his arm and paused. Everyone laughed or smiled at Aunt Kate and Aunt Julia and Mary Jane, who all turned crimson with pleasure. Gabriel went on more boldly. I feel more strongly with every reoccurring year that our country has no tradition which does it so much honor and which it should guard so jealously as that of its hospitality. It is a tradition that is unique as far as my experience goes, and I have visited not a few places abroad among the modern nations. Some would say, perhaps, that with us it is rather a failing than anything to be boasted of. But even that, it is, to my mind, a princely failing, and one that I trust will long be cultivated among us. Of one thing at least, I am sure, as long as this one roof shelters the good ladies aforesaid, and I wish from my heart it may do so for many and many a long year to come, the tradition of genuine, warm-hearted, courteous Irish hospitality, which our forefathers have handed down to us, and which we in turn must hand down to our descendants, is still alive among us. A hearty murmur of assent ran round the table. It shot through Gabriel's mind that Miss Ivers was not there, and that she had gone away discourteously, and he said with confidence in himself, Ladies and gentlemen, a new generation is growing up in our midst, a generation actuated by new ideas and new principles. It is serious and enthusiastic for these new ideas, and its enthusiasm, even when it is misdirected, is, I believe, in the main sincere. But we are living in a skeptical, and if I may use the phrase, a thought-tormented age, and sometimes I fear that this new generation, educated or hyper-educated as it is, will lack those qualities of humanity, of hospitality, of kindly humor which belong to an older day. Listening tonight to the names of all those great singers of the past, it seemed to me, I must confess, that we were living in a less spacious age. Those days might, without exaggeration, be called spacious days. And if they are gone beyond recall, let us hope at least that in gatherings such as this, we shall still speak of them with pride and affection, still cherish in our hearts the memory of those dead and gone great ones whose fame the world will not willingly let die. Hear, hear, said Mr. Brown loudly. But yet, continued Gabriel, his voice falling into a softer inflection, there are always in gatherings such as this sadder thoughts that will recur to our minds, thoughts of the past, of youth, of changes, of absent faces that we miss here tonight. Our path through life is strewn with many such sad memories, and were we to brood upon them always, we could not find the heart to go on bravely with our work among the living. We have all of us living duties and living affections which claim, and rightly claim, our strenuous endeavors. Therefore I will not linger on the past. I will not let any gloomy moralizing intrude upon us here tonight. Here we are gathered together for a brief moment from the bustle and rush of our everyday routine. We are met here as friends, in the spirit of good fellowship, as colleagues, also to a certain extent, in the true spirit of camaraderie as the guest of, what shall I call them, the three graces of the Dublin musical world. The table burst into applause and laughter at this allusion. Aunt Julia vainly asked each of her neighbors in turn to tell her what Gabriel had said. He says we are the three graces, Aunt Julia, said Mary Jane. Aunt Julia did not understand, but she looked up, smiling at Gabriel, who continued in the same vein. Ladies and gentlemen, I will not attempt to play tonight the part that Paris played on another occasion. I will not attempt to choose between them. The task will be an invidious one, and one beyond my poor powers. For when I view them in turn, whether it be our chief hostess herself, whose good heart, whose too good heart, has become a byword with all who know her, or her sister, who seems to be gifted with perennial youth, and whose singing, 
must have been a surprise and a revelation to us all tonight. Or, last but not least, when I consider our youngest hostess, talented, cheerful, hard-working, and the best of nieces, I confess, ladies and gentlemen, that I do not know to which of them I should award the prize. Gabriel glanced down at his aunts, and seeing the large smile on Aunt Julia's face, and the tears which had risen to Aunt Kate's eyes, hastened to his clothes. He raised his glass of port gallantly, while every member of the company fingered a glass expectantly and said loudly, Let us toast them all three together. Let us drink to their health, wealth, long life, happiness and prosperity, and may they long continue to hold the proud and self-won position which they hold in their profession and the position of honor and affection which they hold in our hearts. As the guests stood up, glass in hand, turning towards the three seated ladies, sang in unison with Mr. Brown as leader, For they are jolly gay fellows, for they are jolly gay fellows, for they are jolly gay fellows, which nobody can deny. Aunt Kate was making use of her handkerchief, and even Aunt Julia seemed moved. Freddie Malins beat time with his pudding fork, and the singers turned towards one another, as if in melodious conference, while they sang with emphasis, Unless he tells a lie, unless he tells a lie. Then turning once more towards their hostess, they sang, For they are jolly gay fellows, for they are jolly gay fellows, for they are jolly gay fellows, which nobody can deny. 